Hi everyone and welcome to um, another one of our webinars. This is starting off our series two of the webinars um, with Discover the World Education. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at the challenge of living with natural hazards. I'll be using Iceland as a case study and giving you opportunities to really think like a geographer. Um, as, as teachers, we're always encouraging you to think outside the box, to think of things in different ways. And what we're going to do today within this case study actually is to give you examples of how to think like a geographer and what advantages and benefits you have in order to think like a geographer. I'm going to be using Iceland as the case study here. Um, and as you can see, fantastic picture here of Eirfleck the Jerkel um, in the background of this little traditional Icelandic house. Um, so just to sort of set the scene. So my name is Karen. I work for Discover the World Education. I'm also an Icelandic guide and Icelandic specialist. Prior to working at Discover the World Education, I was a geography teacher and head of department, as well as being a pastoral deputy in a variety of different schools and environments. And I still continue to keep very much up to date um, with the various geography specifications and syllabus. So what we're trying to do with this one is really link this case study to the specifications that you are studying in your schools. Um, and actually look at it both from a student's point of view, as well as a teacher's point of view. So the first thing we want to do is we want to actually start thinking about what it means to think like a geographer. And I've done a little bit of research on this, and I've also spoken to some students, some A-level students and some GCSE students, as well as some teachers, as to what they think it means to think like a geographer. Now we think, a, a collective group, that it means that you have the ability to look at different aspects of countries, of case studies, of topics, and look at this from a political point of view, a social point of view, an environmental point of view, an economical point of view, as well as the physical location point of view. Also using some critical thinking skills. So maybe to challenge what you are reading, what you are seeing, what you are hearing. Um, most importantly, to question those things as well um, and to look at the different images, data, resources that you have, look at the information that you have and actually then draw your own conclusions on that. Um, so it's not just looking at it from lots of different aspects, so basically being like a little octopus, but also to critically think about some of that information as well. We live in a very, very easily accessible data world where you are bombarded with lots and lots of information. Some of it is true, some of it is very factual, and some of it bends the rules just a little bit. And the more we learn to critically think and challenge some of the things that is bombarding us, um, the better people and the more informed that we will become. The more you critically think and think like a geographer at key stage three and four, the better because it will become very natural when you start doing your key stage five studies and actually train you to be a geographical scholar. So not just thinking like a geographer, but thinking like a geographical scholar. And that's what we want. We want you to ask why, um, you know, as a small child, you're always asking that question, why, 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 why? Um, and actually, we still want you to do that as you get to be older students as well. So the six main aims, the key aims of this webinar are what are natural hazards? What are the factors affecting risk? What are the natural hazards in Iceland? And the potential risk of those hazards in Iceland? Then start looking at why people still live in Iceland. We're going to learn that it is quite a hazardous area. So yet that they've been living there for over 1100 years. So why, what is so special about Iceland 
that they continue to live there. And then why and how the um, Icelandic people minimise the risk of the natural hazards that they are sort of like facing and have the challenge of. You will see here in the bottom left hand corner of my slide, there's a little Icelandic symbol, the Icelandic um, sort of map with the flag and then underneath it thinking like a geographer and where you see this symbol this will give you the opportunity to really think like a geographer to look at the different aspects to look at it from a political angle a social angle an environmental economical and as well as the physical angle okay so let's get started on this so natural hazards then they are extreme natural events. We cannot stop them, okay? And a hazard is something that causes a loss of life or extreme damage to property and disrupt human activities. Now we, as we know, we can place these into two different categories. There are the tectonic hazards, the landslides, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, and obviously there we have the volcanoes. And then the second category of natural hazards are the climatic hazards, the flooding, the hurricane or the cyclone, the tornadoes and the droughts. Okay, so you've got your two different categories, climatic and tectonic hazards. Now, Iceland itself doesn't really suffer from too many climatic hazards. Yes, it has an erratic climate, but not often does this cause um, sort of major risk or hazards to the people and the buildings and stuff like that. So we're really going to focus today on the tectonic hazards. So hazards are only a problem, as we said, when they pose a risk, and that is a risk to the people and technically to the economy, to the buildings, to the infrastructure. When and where they happen is a major factor, but so is the nature of the area. We could look at urbanisation, the level of economic development, the infrastructure, the emergency response, the, monitor the monitoring and the prediction, the healthcare and the money. So this really is a fantastic topic to allow you to think like a geographer because you're looking at lots of different aspects of the country and the people within the country in order to sort of like, you know, make relevance and make sense of your case study. These two pictures here, the first one is an earthquake in New Zealand. And as you can see, this posed a large risk. The earthquake happened in an area that was quite densely populated and built up, and it is a high risk natural hazard. The picture at the bottom is actually of a volcano in Iceland. And you might look at that and think, well, actually that's quite high risk, but it's not because it's in a very, very sparsely populated area. So therefore, Although a volcano is erupting and you can see there is ash and lava and lava bombs and all of that sort of stuff, it's actually quite low risk. We can also look at sort of like how these um, natural hazards are managed and how the different countries and populations manage the risk. And most importantly, to actually understand the risk. You cannot manage and plan for a natural hazard unless you understand the risk that that natural hazard poses to you. You'll also see throughout my presentation that there are a number of video links. Now, due to time constraints, I don't really want to keep you much longer than an hour today, 45 minutes possibly. I don't want to show you all of these videos, but what you may want to do is go back through the PowerPoint presentation and use some of these links to actually develop and enrich your learning and understanding. This particular video link is only a six minute video all about the volcanoes in Iceland, so showing the different types of eruptions, which gives you that depth of understanding as to the risk that is happening in Iceland itself. So Iceland is on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and our focus today is on Iceland. It is one of the only places on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that is above the Atlantic Ocean. 
The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is the longest sub-ocean mountain range. It is a constructive plate boundary in its simplest form. You have two plates, you can see from this diagram here. You have the Eurasian plate on the west, the east, sorry, and the North American plate on the east. And they are very, very slowly moving apart at approximately two to four centimetres every year. It's a divergent plate boundary. And along this boundary, we have ridges, mountains and volcanoes. Iceland also have, has a very large magma chamber, a hotspot sitting under it. And because of that, there are over 200 volcanoes, 33 of which are currently considered to be active. So the challenge of living with natural hazards in Iceland is incredibly evident wherever you go. So as I said, Iceland has 33 active volcanoes. And to add to this and extend the hazard even further, over a third of the island's active volcanoes, <clears throat> excuse me, are buried under glacial ice. Iceland is known as the land of fire and ice. And that's what makes it so exciting because it's this combination of volcanoes and glaciers that makes it the land of fire and ice. This combination produces a very distinct hazard, hazard called Jörklaups. They are high magnitude glacial floods. And the risk in Iceland of these glacial floods is very high. And it's actually considered by the Icelandic people to be more of a hazard than actually the volcanic activity itself. The reason why they are so hazardous is because they move incredibly fast. The volcano starts to heat up under huge amounts of ice. It melts very, very quickly. And that ice then flows down through the valleys and the gorges at a huge speed. And quite really very, very deep water mixed with volcanic ash. So it's kind of like a runny cement very difficult to move away from, very, very difficult to predict, sort of like, you know, how fast they're going to travel. And we're going to look at the impact of those glacial floods when we look at Katla as a distinct mini case study within this particular case study and how they are predicting, planning, monitoring and preparing for not if, but when Katla then erupts. So, Let's look at the population of Iceland. And I think if we are wanting and desiring to think like geographers, we have to look at the challenge of living within these natural hazards. And therefore we have to put the population at the center of our study. Iceland is only 44,000, 103,000 miles and kilometers squared. So 44,000 square miles, 103,000 square kilometers in size. It's around about the size of Ireland. So if you look at the, the island as a whole, North and South Ireland, that is around about the same size of Iceland. It has a population of just over 350,000 which is around about, and I tried to look at some towns and cities that had very similar populations. Croydon has a very similar population. Nottingham has a very similar population. And Gdansk in Poland also has a very similar population. 78% of this population live within this circle, this red circle here in the southwest corner of Iceland which means that the rest of Iceland is very, very sparsely populated. There are less than three people per square kilometer across the whole of the island. It is the most sparsely populated country in Europe. So when we look at the people, they've lived in this country for some time we know that they are at risk of volcanic hazard, particularly volcanoes, yerklaups, earthquakes, 
there are 33 active volcanoes with a third of these under the ice. So we may ask, well, why do people still live here and why have they lived here for so long? Magnus Magnusson, he, for those teachers who are with me this afternoon, you will recognize his name because he was the presenter of Mastermind for some time. So he was very much the, the sort of like the force in, in introducing the big black chair to us. And he is Icelandic. And he said, when you live in a country which moves alarmingly under your feet every five years or so with an earthquake or a volcanic eruption, you face like the saga heroes of old. The Icelandic people love a saga, it's a story. A choice of two courses of action. Neither of them is good, either to flee the country and all its hazards or to stay and brave them out. And for more than 1100 years, the people of Iceland have chosen to stay and brave them out. And we're now going to explore the reasons why this very resilient nation has decided to stay and brave them out. So the first reason is geothermal energy. Geothermal energy has been harnessed by the Icelandic people since 1907. There are five major geothermal plants around the country and they produce around about 30% of the country's electricity and around about 87% of the country's hot water requirements. The rest of the electricity comes from hydroelectric power. Iceland does not have any other source of power at all, so therefore it doesn't have coal burning, um, or oil burning stations at all. It is all completely renewable and sustainable. Here, the pictures we have here are of the Hecklesade geothermal power plant. It's the largest power plant in Iceland, the sixth largest geothermal plant in the world. And it is considered to be the most advanced technology that is around worldwide in terms of geothermal development. And the skills and techniques incorporated by the engineers and scientists in Iceland are being shared all around the world. I was recently in the Heckler's Hady power plant doing one of their amazingly fantastic interactive tours. And as we were being taken around, I was with a group of students, and as we were being taken around, a group of 10 very well dressed engineers and scientists walked in and I spoke to um, the lady um, Anna who I know very well who works in the geothermal power plant and I asked you know who were these people that were having the tour of the station and they were actually from um, a developmental engineering company in Indonesia who was spending time with the Icelandic scientists and engineers learning about how they are harnessing the geothermal power so that they can then go back to Indonesia and actually develop their own geothermal power as well. And I recently heard from Anna and she said actually the Heckless Hady power plant, um, the owner, the, the electricity developer there, has actually started to invest and help them um, to develop this particular technology, which is absolutely fantastic. It's, it's globalization at its best form. So how does geothermal energy work? Well, there is groundwater under the ground all the time. And because it is a geothermal area, this means that this particular area is quite close to the magma chamber underneath. So therefore, water from under the ground is superheated by the magma underneath the ground. And the steam is then forced through the turbines which generates the electricity. The water, which is superheated, either returns back down into the natural stores under the ground, or some of it is then piped and pumped into the large pipe network to the local, local towns and cities. So you can see here at the top, you've got the pipes here, which is taking the hot water to all the local towns and cities you'll notice that they're in a zigzag formation. And I, I once sort of like decided to ask, why are they zigzag? Why aren't they just sort of like in a straight line? Surely it would be quicker 
and more efficient to put the water in a straight line, you know, and get it from the power station down to the towns and cities. However, if you were to do that, it would actually travel too fast and the water would become too hot. So therefore they put it in a zigzag formation to slow the water down and to actually keep it at the optimum temperature for the hot water systems in their houses and their businesses. Now at Heckless Hady, they have six high pressure turbines and one low pressure steam turbine. There are over 30 wells and the boreholes that they have drilled down to tap this water are going down around about 3,000 metres, that's three kilometres down into the bedrock. It's very cheap, it's sustainable and it's renewable and it's completely carbon neutral. To give you some idea of the cost of the electricity in Iceland, on average a house of four people would pay in Iceland for their electricity, their hot water and their heating around about £17 per month. Now, to give you some comparison, particularly for the students that are following me this afternoon, your household, if you have a house on average of about four people, will be paying £200 per month. So the comparison between the two is unrecognisable. £17 a month in Iceland and on average £200 a month in the UK. Because of this cheapness, geothermal energy has enabled other industries to develop. For example, aluminium. Aluminium processing is high on the list of needing heat. They need huge amounts of heat and electricity to actually process the raw materials into the silver foil that you have in your kitchens. And because of the very cheap energy sources that Iceland have, there are now three major aluminium plants in Iceland, and it is now part of the economy. 14% of the economy is now down to aluminium processing. There are a couple of videos here that I would encourage you to watch if you are really interested in geothermal energy. It's a fascinating thing. The first YouTube clip here is the drone images of the actual power plant itself. Fantastic, architecturally very bespoke and unique and quite spectacular. The second YouTube video on here, it's only six minutes and it talks about how geothermal energy is produced and how the different boreholes and turbines actually work and how they generate the hot water and the electricity in Iceland. So again, enriching and developing your learning from those particular clips there. So let's move on and we're going to look at farming. Now, when we're in school and we learn about the sort of like the benefits of living in a volcanic area, the first thing you would say is fertile soils, okay? And yes, there are fertile soils, but Iceland is very, very new geologically. It's only, and I know this doesn't sound new, but geologically, this is very, very new, 25 million years old. So the soils in Iceland are also very new. And you also have to remember that it's sitting on very, very hard resistant lava, which takes a long time to break down. The climate in Iceland can be very cold. It obviously sits just 40 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. So therefore warm days do happen, but they're few and far between. The average temperature, for example, across you know, the summer months is between 16 and 18 degrees. So because they have a lack of heat, there was also, and we will come on to this, not many trees or um, sort of like wildlife in some areas in Iceland. So you don't have the decomposition rates that you would do in other countries. So therefore the soils are quite thin and they're quite new. But we'll come back to that later. Let's first of all continue our sort of discussions about geothermal energy and how geothermal energy can really help with the farming. What the Icelandic people have done brilliantly is they have harnessed the geothermal energy 
to heat and light greenhouses 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We already know that geothermal energy is very, very cheap and it is available in the majority of areas in Iceland. If they haven't got geothermal energy, they've got hydroelectric power, but obviously that's a very different topic. And what we're focusing on here is how they are living in a, a natural hazard, a volcano, volcanic area. For example, Husavik, it's one of the no most northern towns in Iceland. It literally is 44 kilometers from the Arctic Circle. However, it has a very, very large geothermal greenhouse area, bottom left picture here. And they produce 500 tonnes of tomato each year. That is 50% of the domestic consumption of tomatoes in Iceland. They also have the ability to grow 95% of the demand for cucumbers, um, which, which is just incredible. Bearing in mind, we have a four month growing season in Iceland, they are able to produce that many tomatoes and cucumbers to feed the demand of the Icelandic nation. They also grow peppers or they call them paprika. Um, they also do 40 metric tons a year of strawberries. And that's just one greenhouse area in Husavik in the north of Iceland. The bottom right picture here is showing the Friedheimer greenhouses, which is in southwest Iceland. They produce 370 tonnes of tomatoes each year, 30% of the domestic um, consumption. So actually just between these two greenhouse areas, we have enough tomatoes that they don't have to import tomatoes. The Friesheimer greenhouse system is amazing. They have got over 5,000 square metres of glass houses, they use 100,000 tonnes of hot water. And between these two greenhouse areas, there have been years where the tomato um, production has been so good that they are able to export tomatoes to other Nordic countries. Now, I, having, I've been going to Iceland for 20, 25 years, and so I know what the climate is like. I know what the soils are like and all of that sort of stuff. And the thought that they are able to export tomatoes, which traditionally come from hot countries like Spain or the Canary Islands or somewhere like that, is unbelievable. And it's all because of geothermal energy. It's all because they are sitting under or on top of sort of like this amazing volcanic system. One of my favorite towns in Iceland is called Kvevagerdi. It's in the southwest of Iceland and it's nicknamed the Flower Village. And that is because it has the highest concentration of greenhouses in Iceland. And they produce a variety of produce um, and flowers and, and loads of different things going on there. And they have been doing this since 2008. There was an earthquake in 2008 in the Quevergurdi area and they then opened up, this earthquake opened up new steam vents and the local residents and farmers in that particular area, they were able to harness these new steam vents and set up this new greenhouse town. Only 12 years ago, 2008, there was something like 800 people living in Quevergurdi. And now, because of the geothermal energy and the amount of employment that it can give people, there are on average, I think there's around about 3,500 people now living in Quevergurdi. Now, my final thing to talk about in terms of geothermal energy and farming are mushrooms, um, one of my favourite vegetables. Um, and there is a farm, just one farm in the area of Flodia, which is in the southwest of Iceland, which in the last 10 years, has managed to use geothermal energy and the hot water and the steam to cultivate and grow over 10 tonnes of mushrooms per week. That is enough to supply the demand of the whole of the Icelandic population. So just amazing, one small farm is able to produce that many mushrooms, which is absolutely fantastic. So let's move away from geothermal farming now and look at something else. Afforestation. Now you may think, well, why is this relevant? Afforestation has got nothing to do with geothermal energy, nothing to do with tectonic systems, nothing to do with natural hazards, but actually it has. 
And this is where thinking like geographers, going outside the box a little bit, it is just so exciting. Iceland has a goal to create 5% more forest cover over the next 50 years. The whole of Iceland was extensively deforested in Viking times, and part of the climate plan is to plant on average 4 million trees per year. This will help them to achieve their carbon neutral status, which they're hoping to get by 2030. But it's also to protect the soils from the wind and the water erosion. Geothermally heated water is a fundamental part of this because the trees are grown quite quickly in greenhouses. And then what's really interesting here is that the warm water is then used to irrigate the soils and the land, which extends the growing season because it keeps the soil that they are planting the trees in ice and frost, frost free. So where you have got areas in maybe April and May and in October and November, which will have normally been frozen for the whole of the winter, they irrigate these particular areas so that actually they are able to plant the trees and the trees obviously are able to grow for a longer period of time. The warm water is obviously geothermal and it has come from within the lava bedrock. So it also contains high levels of minerals and very, very fertile. So it's a natural fertilizer as well. And that's how we can link afforestation to geothermal energy, okay? There is an amazing, I think this video that I've got here is all about the afforestation scheme in Iceland and the reason why they're doing it. It's not very long, but it's really, really interesting. It also has fantastic imagery of some of the new forests and the landscapes in Iceland as well. So I would encourage you to watch that. So let's go back to farming, but not geothermal. And remember we said right at the beginning about this link with sort of like volcanic areas and fertile soils. And if you study Italy um, as a sort of like a volcanic environment, obviously that is something that is quite relevant because the size of the volcanoes there are used to grow the crops and the vineyards and, and fantastic agriculture that goes on in Italy. But in Iceland, it is slightly different. As we said, the soils are not yet fully developed because geologically, it's very new. And they are very special and unique on a global scale. And they are actually called andesoils. And this is a, a slightly different sort of soil than what you would normally get, okay? Now, andesoils, they are fertile. They are high water retention soils but they lack cohesion. So therefore, they can be quite difficult to cultivate. Now, a fifth of the land in Iceland is suitable for fodder production, but because of these difficulties, only 6% of that is cultivated. The rest is either undeveloped or used for livestock. For example, we've got a picture there of um, sheep and they also have quite a lot of cows and horses in Iceland as well. Over the last 10 years or so though because of improved technology and advancements the Icelandic people are now able to grow potatoes, barley, oats and rapeseed particularly on the outwash plains of Hekla and Eyjafjallajökull. So again here not only the links to sort of like the fertility of the soil but also where you go on the outwash plains where there has been flooding before from the eruptions of these volcanoes, the soils here are a little bit deeper and they are able to use these areas to actually grow better crops. Now, we know that by extending their own farming techniques and producing more food, you become less reliant on imports and this really strengthens the economy and keeps the living costs lower. And I've seen a real decrease in the cost of food in Iceland over the last 20 years, as long as you buy locally. If you buy something that comes from another country, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. Iceland is an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So therefore it costs quite a lot to get stuff there. 
But if you buy locally and buy local produce, you now find that these are considerably cheaper. OK, so let's move on from farming now and look at another factor as to why people still live within an area of natural hazard and risk, and that is tourism. You may have heard of a little volcano and you may have studied a volcano called Eyjafjallajökull, Yerkel. And I'm sure that some of you who are joining me this afternoon um, were part of my either the GA webinar or our recent Discover the World Education webinar on Eyjafjallajökull Yerkel and looking at this case study and looking at the developments of planning and preparing and monitoring and learning from that particular eruption. And if you did want to um, have a look at that case study, you will find it on our YouTube channel um, and you can watch that at any time or use um, as um, a lesson. I know we're all teaching remotely at the moment, so please do have a look at that. Now, A.F. fleckley firmly put Iceland on the map. Um, it really sort of like springboarded um, Iceland into sort of like people's imaginations because not one, um, one because the global impact was massive. Obviously the, the flights were all canceled. Um, it had a huge impact on America, on Asia, on Europe because of the flight problem. But also because when images were being shown of Iceland and this volcano, people wanted to see it. First of all, they wanted to see the volcano erupting, but secondly, they wanted to see these landscapes that actually were pretty unique. And tourism really started to increase once that eruption had happened. You can see here from the graph at the bottom that tourist numbers were pretty steady, increasing quite slowly. And then 2010 came along, a. Fleckley Urkel and the eruption, and you can see that tourist numbers really started to rise. There were other factors that may have triggered this surge, and this is a really good example of where you can think like a geographer. So we look at the information, we analyse the information, we consider the data, we consider the statistics, we look at all the different information that we've got in front of us and we can make a decision. Now, obviously, Eyjafjallajökull Yerkel happened in 2010, okay, and tourist numbers started to go up in 2010. So we know that Eyjafjallajökull Yerkel was part of the reason why there was a surge in tourist numbers. But also, you can see there were more airlines flying to Iceland it became a shooting location for film and TV. The exchange rate got slightly better, which meant that it was cheaper. There was some coordinated marketing and social media was starting to become more used across the whole world. Now, I looked at the stats, the data, the evidence, and I, I kind of wanted to decide whether or not Eyjafjallajökull like Yerkel was the biggest part, the biggest factor in this particular thing. And I think it was. I, I think that Eyjafjallajökull like really did play the most important part, okay? Um, but let's have a look and see why I have come to that um, sort of like theory. So Iceland's tourism, you can see, really started to increase from 2010 to 2017. And you can see that it is now 45% of Iceland's economy, so it's huge. 13% of the total employment is involved or employed in the tourism sector. And the proportion has increased dramatically since the 2010 eruption. So that really lends, that's one of my sort of like thinking like a job of the facts really. You know, there has to be some sort of correlation between the rise in tourism numbers and the volcanic activity. At the same time, however, inspired by Iceland, which is Iceland's tourist board, they saw an opportunity. But look at their tagline. Iceland has never been more awake 
and there has never been a more exciting time to visit the country. So we may think that the media campaign sparked the increase in tourism numbers, but look at the tagline that they used. They used a volcanic eruption, a negative natural event into something very, very positive. And they saw it as a springboard for a very influential and successful marketing campaign. You know, and that I really think, yes, the tourism sort of like campaign was very, very successful. And I would encourage you to watch this only two and a half minute video. One, because it shows you some of the sites of Iceland, but also it is very Icelandic in the way it's put together. It's comical and it's funny um, and it will make you laugh, um, but it is a, a fantastic campaign. OK, so, yes, they they had a very successful campaign, but it was sparked by the volcano. It sparked new interest in the country. And you can see here some of the famous TV shows that I'm sure you watch Game of Thrones, Vikings, a film called Passengers, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, Fast and Furious, some of the James Bond films. They all started to use Iceland as a fantastic location. And it is now considered to be a prime filming location um, if you want some quite unique and bespoke landscapes. Again, sparked from the volcanic eruption that happened in 2010. And then obviously Justin Bieber here, he's um, a small pop star, I think, who's had something like 45 million views on this particular song, sorry, 455 million views on this particular song on YouTube, but I'll show you where he discovers some of the more remote areas in Iceland. And some of those areas in Iceland now do have to be sort of like limited in terms of their numbers, although that is improving. So I do think that sort of like looking at some of that evidence, we can actually see that it was the volcano that actually sparked the rise in tourism numbers. Another thing that adds to that is that the tourism numbers in the last two and a half years, let's discount 2020 because we know that the tourism numbers are, are nil at the moment. But if we look at the tourism numbers over the last two and a half years, they have really decreased because we are not hearing about volcanoes anymore. And, and they have remained sort of like, you know, just the tourism is going there, not just for the volcanoes, but for everything else that Iceland can offer, which adds to my evidence as to the fact why it was the volcano that triggered the increase in the tourism numbers. So, so far we have focused on the benefits of living with natural hazards and how the Icelanders have adapted to living with this challenge. But there's also a high level of risk. So we do have to plan, monitor, predict and protect. Now, the Icelandic monitoring and prediction systems are considered to be alongside the very best in the world. And technology is leading the way for other volcanic risk areas. And you can see here an example of the, some of the things that they do. And we're just going to look at a key sort of like some of these key points here so that we can actually sort of like look and see what the Icelandic people do. A key part of their planning and preparation process is to communicate and inform. And this has to be effective, efficient, clear and valuable. We can see from what's happened with different governments with the COVID-19 crisis as to what happens if the messages aren't effective, efficient, clear because they become invaluable. So therefore, the Icelandic people have used this logic mo model of assumed process from education to response, and then looked at the factors that may impede a successful outcome. They've used case studies, really looking at social behaviors to continually develop this model. And by having this model, they've developed preparation plans which are effective and are of value. So first of all, they look at the hazards and the risk education. They then look at the different communications between the different stakeholders. They look at greater hazard awareness and risk perception, which empowers people. They then look at how well those households and communities are prepared. And then lastly, 
but perhaps most importantly, as to how people will comply with the warning and the evacuation instructions. Now, in general, Icelanders are quite conformist and compliant in their nature. They're very loyal and protective of each other and their country. So they do have a desire to look out for each other and to look after their country. So number one on that model was the hazard and risk education. And there is one major government website in Iceland that provides all the information of the risk and the challenge of, of living with volcanic hazards. This particular slide is one of their major ones and it's basically to inform and educate people because what they think and believe is that if the popula population understands the nature of the risk, they are more likely to have confidence in dealing with the risk. So you are empowering them with education. Alongside this government website is an amazing um, strategic system called Future Volk. And this was um, a planning sort of like team that was put together after the 2010 eruption, which is a, a strategic thing which looks at the monitoring um, and looks at developing new methods increases the scientific understanding of tectonic and magmatic activity. And they use a variety of different techniques to do this. So they look at the weather, they look at which direction the wind is blowing, they look at the different densities of ash, they look at the different sort of minerals and temperatures of the volcanoes, as well as the glaciers, as well as the water. And this is a really, really fundamental sort of system and network, which puts us in a much better place for the future. Some of the future Volk systems are shown here, and you can go onto their website and look at their whole plan and strategy. But you can see some of the images here. They're looking at the gas emissions. They're using GPS and seismic monitors. They're checking the heights of magma areas, the water levels, to see if some of the glaciers are melting. They also look for temperatures, levels of sulfur. And this continued monitoring means that we have improved predictions, which means our planning and our preparations are better. And the future Volk systems are very sophisticated. They are very forward thinking. They are innovative and it's a very good and structured program. And it doesn't just mean that the Icelandic people are better prepared for the challenge of when this natural hazard happens, but also for when the whole world and Europe is affected by it. So let's go back to the Icelandic website because you can go onto this government website and you can look at quite in-depth detail about all the active and dormant volcanoes in Iceland. I focused here on Katla. And the reason why I focused on Katla is because it is one of the most active um, heightened awareness volcanoes in Iceland. Um, it, is a, it is an active volcano, although it hasn't erupted since 1918. But as you can see from this particular website, they do have the activity level as high because history tells us that this volcano generally erupts every 50 years or so. The last time it erupted was 1918. So you can see it's very overdue. It generally erupts within 10 years of Eyjafjallajökull the Yerkel erupting. So again, it is overdue. Eyjafjallajökull the Yerkel erupted in April 2010. Katla is a huge volcano and it has a massive caldera. The caldera itself is actually the same size as Reykjavik around about 14 kilometers wide, 11 kilometers deep, sorry, in depth. They are not saying if Katla erupts, but the Icelandic people do talk about actually when Katla erupts. And this is the one that they are really focusing on and have fantastic preparation, monitor and planning on. Now, Within this, they have a clear plan. And I know that the imagery here isn't very good, but I just want to show you 
what um, the website shows as a whole, and we'll move on in a minute just to see some of this in a little bit more detail. But the most important thing here is the 112 app and the QR code. And if you were to be in the Catla area, then you need to download this on your phone, and everybody is instructed to do this, because if, for example, the um, scientists and the monitoring systems decided that Catla was due to erupt, they would send you a text and that would alert you. You then need to send a message to 112 to say where you are, because if you were to get stranded in either a flood or in an ash flow or something like that, they would know exactly where you are. This text can also give you lots of different information as to what you need to do. And this system was used in Rakens on the peninsula in the southwest of Iceland very recently, where one, and, and actually an extinct volcano, started to show signs of rising. So they were thought that there might be some sort of tectonic activity. So they sent a text to all the people in that area and they were asked to go to a town meeting and they were actually sort of given instructions as to what to do next. So this instruction sheet in a little bit more detail, what I love about this map is it doesn't just, it's not just a map, and we know as geographers that we're a little bit obsessed about maps, we're quite passionate about, about maps. But this shows you where the emergency aid centres are, where there are likely to be road closures, the escape routes that they suggest that you should take, the principal routes of where the flooding will probably be and where they consider the flood area to be as well. It also gives you instructions. Again, you can see the 112 app there. So lots of information. And I think this is a very simple but informative way of keeping the population in this area completely up to date, informed and educated. You can see here at the bottom of this particular map is a small town of Vik. Vik is one of the prettiest towns in Iceland. It's really, really lovely. It sits at the bottom of quite a steep valley. And at the top of that valley is Katla. OK, there are only a thousand residents in Vik, but they all have very, very clear guidance as to what to do should Katla start to erupt. Now, Julius, a very good friend of um, the team at Discover the World Education and a resident of Beek, he's showing a, a sort of like instruction guide here. And all the residents in Beek have one of these. They also have a checklist of what to do. And that means that they have to tick the boxes. And then at the bottom of this particular evacuation sign, they put this in the window to say that they have done all of these specific things. This is the car that they have taken, and this is how many people they have taken with them. And then they have to evacuate to the church car park, which is on the highest land in Beek. Um, and Julia said that all the residents know this. They've got it by the front door. They've got a box by the front door, which has got some emergency supplies. Um, and they just know because they've only got 30 minutes to get to that high ground. And you can see here what Yulia says. He says the Katla volcano is considered to be one of the most dangerous volcanoes in Iceland. Um, and they know that if it was to erupt, they've only got 30 minutes to get to that higher ground. If you want to learn a little bit more about Katla, there is a little YouTube clip here. It's only five minutes long. It's Grapevine Reykjavik, which is a, a magazine in Iceland. Um, and you can watch that and it will extend your knowledge um, a little bit more. Now, this volcano um, is not the only one that they give you evacuation plans for. They also give it for Hecla as well, um, because that is considered to be quite a high risk volcano. Again, the messages are the same. The 112 app, some instructions there as well as some of the sort of like information as to where they expect because of the future Volk and the fantastic monitoring, planning and preparation, why they, where they expect it to go. So you may think, well, hold on a minute, you know, these people have been living in Iceland for sort of like, you know, just over a thousand years now. And, you know, they are dealing with quite extreme and harsh natural environment as well as quite considerable natural hazards. And it is a challenge, there's no doubt about that. But they are 
ranked as the top three happiest places in the world to live. They consistently rank in the top six of the Human Development Index, and they are within the top 10 of the longest life expectancy. And if I was to say that the top 12 countries of life expectancy have something like four months between them. So they are really quite a very developed nation, a very happy nation, um, and really embrace all that nature has given them. They actually relish some of the natural hazards that they live with because they really do utilize them to the best advantage. For example, you can see here on the right hand side, hot tub culture in Iceland is massive. Um, you know, a really good Icelandic thing to do is to, is to relax in the hot tubs, in the swimming pools. They have football pitches, which are geothermally heated so that you can play sport all year round. And we know that exercise and being outside is so beneficial to great mental health. And I think, you know, their whole culture of embracing and relishing that everything that nature has to give to them really does help with their positive and long life that they have. They have learned to be resilient and they work with the nature and they actually do respect the nature and they call it the nature. They've given it a title and a capital letter because that's how high they respect it. They've learned that they have to exist within these extreme and challenging conditions. They can't change it. So they work with it and they understand sort of like how they have to be resilient and coexist under these extreme conditions. It is one of the most productive economies in the world, and it is considered to be most sustainable and responsible. They have a very clear plan on becoming carbon neutral in the future. So all in all, we have learned today about the challenge of living with natural hazards, not just the challenge, but how people predict, prepare, plan and monitor it, and how they embrace and harness living with natural hazards. Um, and I really hope that you've been encouraged to think like a geographer, to look at the different bits of information that are given to you and actually, you know, question that information and look at it from lots of different perspectives. I just want to finish on a very amazing Icelandic saying phrase, which is called Thetaradast. And if there's one phrase that captures the Icelandic's innate sense of optimism better than any other, it is better adapt. And it really sort of like captures the essence of their optimism, their irreverence, their faith, their tenacity. And it is a phrase that they actually use constantly because they are living with the challenge of natural hazards. And basically it means that this will all work out one way or another. So for example, just lost your job. Theta adast. No money in the bank. Theta adast. COVID-19. Theta adast. A volcano just spewed ash all over your arable land. Theta adast. And to me, this incorporates a real profound philosophy because when things are totally dark, like in an ash cloud, or when things are pretty bad and you can't see your way out, often the best thing you can do is actually let go, so theta adast, and just trust because sometimes, somehow, and some way, things usually work out for the best. So I'm going to leave you with Theta Radast. We do have another amazing webinar tomorrow, which really encourages um, critical thinking and thinking like a geographer. It's to fly or not to fly, which is an amazing topic. And I would really, really encourage you to tune in tomorrow to my colleague, Sarah, who's going to deliver this amazing webinar. Um, and really get you to critically think like a geographer. All I have to left to say is thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Take care, continue to look out for each other, and I look forward to seeing you at my next webinar. Thank you.